this is the Thursday episode where there actually are the two girls and the one pod. Yeah. Um, I'm a girl. I have another girl with me. She's a woman. And she's a wonderful woman. I'd just like to say, Mary Custis, hello, good thanks. Oh, you're gorgeous. I said it in such a lovely way. Can you please say it for me? Hello, good thanks. Here I use. <laughs> it's just, when did Acropolis now come out? Late 80s. Okay, because I'm a child of the 80s, so I watched it religiously. Orthodox, religiously, yeah. um, and you were everything, everything, and I, and just you know, everyone would just try. It was kind of like a Kylie Mole and an Effie was, you know, who, were the two characters that everyone at school. Would I wasn't just very moly. No, it was always frigid. Oh, yes, you know, um, she was very frigid. Yeah, but she was sort of flirtatious and frigid. Exactly. You know, I think she wanted uh, the experience, but not the the you know, not the um, you know. Yeah, the, the, the whole digits. experience, yeah. if you know what I'm saying. I do. And I, I say that word with both sweat spellings. I, I couldn't agree more with Effie. You know, no one wants to play stinky fingers at the back of the no. ang- Anglican church that's, or the Orthodox church watching a um, something happen. You know, I went to an Orthodox Greek wedding. Yes. It, it takes forever, doesn't it? My mother and I had never been to one. My cousin married a Greek Orthodox man, beautiful man called Jim. And we'd never been in a church. We'd never been in one. We're like, we're the whitest atheists that you, you've got going. So we were like, our eyes were so wide and we were just like looking at everything, everything. There was so much going on in there. It is. It, it looked is very to me, adorned. Very adorned. It looked to me like God had come in and thrown up everywhere with his love. Wow. No bile. No just bile. Just the vegetables. Just the stuff that hadn't digested. Yeah. And he just placed it everywhere. It was the longest thing I've ever seen. And it then we long. had to go to her church, the Catholic church, and do it all again, which oh, was a lot. that's just It was That's you know, Look, we got very drunk later, but it was, I that don't know helped. if it was all worth it. But interesting. Now, how did Effie come about before Acropolis Now or did Acropolis Now say we have a character and you're the one? No, Effie was born loosely out of a character I played in Wogs Out of Work, which was the stage show that was the precursor to Acropolis Now. I played a character on that show that then, weirdly, we animated even more so for television, which is normally not how it goes. The other way, Normally yeah. it's the other way. But the basis was... Um, Yeah, the Western suburbs, um, ethnic girls, particularly the Greek ones, although the Italians have that accent as well. And and, and you find that accent in New Jersey, in all different parts of, um, you know, big cities where there's a lot of multiculturalism. And to me, I've always um, thought of the accent as a marriage between the broken English at home and the Yobo Australian accent, you know, that's that sort of great... A merging of those two sounds, and so you get that fantastic Effie accent. I love that accent. Anastasia from Gogglebox has that accent full on, who yeah. sits next to Faye, who's also Greek, but doesn't have that accent. So it's it's really amazing how thick it can be with a certain group of people or one particular person. I adore it. Can't get enough of it. Because when you tell a story with an accent that good, the story is so much more colourful. That's it. It's... it's um it's very evocative and I think it often uh, represents a very confident working class person. Me too. You it, know? Yes, yes. I think it's almost like rappers, you know, when they speak their lingo, you know, you're yeah. just like, wow, okay, okay, it's this just, is good, don't understand stream, a lot of it. It's a stream of, of, it, of thoughts that just is. come out really easily. There's a musicality, there's a confidence, so you really get a sense of – you know the the hierarchy in in um, okay. This is this is what gets born out of coming up through a community that you feel very emboldened by, and you refuse to apologise for. Yes, you know? there's something super cool in that. Yeah, well said. You should uh, be a writer or something. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to talk about the first time we met, which was only recently. Yeah. Um, at the glorious Tina Arenas, this is your life recording at Channel Seven. Um, which went for, I think, approximately um, 85 hours. Only, yeah. It was. I, I kept saying throughout the shoot, this is my life. <laughs> it's become your life it's, now. Yeah, why are we still here? Yeah. You know, I thought that we were just going to pop in for a few hours. Well, when they actually said to me for my 
um, call time. I was like, well, that's late. But I was in there like kind of halfway through, like because people, you know, had to get through all the makeup chairs. There was that many people. I mean, Tina Arena has been around for 95 years. So, of course, there's going to be a million people people and I couldn't believe they asked me like I've only known Tina a few years but they did want people from right back to right now yeah um and so we met in the green room and that's where the two big screens were up with the kind of two camera angles so we were all eating drinking or watching and as people were coming going um we're watching Obviously, everything gets edited, so the f- it went for five hours, like 85 yeah. is a lot, but yeah, it did go for five hours, the recording, which was then edited down to, I'd say, a 45-minute episode. Now, what we saw and loved, you were sitting next to me, you were in the middle of me and John Foreman and his manager sitting on the arm of that lounge. We're watching the young uh, Johnny Young part. So it was him, Bevan Adensall, and the the one that lives in Paris as well. And he used to sing Johnny Knowles. No, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Be- beautiful, beautiful man. He used to sing with Tina. And it was like Tina and Johnny, like they were, you know, did an album, I think, as six-year-olds. It was hilarious. So they're talking. Anyway, Mel Doyle, who was the host, said, now Johnny to Johnny Young – you must have realised quite early on that you had someone really special in Tina, like compared to the other talent. I mean, they're all talented, but now this is something I have to say didn't go to air, and this is the reason because <laughs> of what Johnny Young said. <laughs> this is a first. This is a first. No one, no one knows this story publicly, and I just think <laughs> best story in the world. He goes, "Well, yes, of course we knew." Tina was, she would have made it without us. She would have made it without Young Talent Time. But can I just say, he said, the one thing I'm so proud of in this country in Young Talent Time was how diverse and how much we gave every young artist a go. We had ones like Tina. We had others who weren't so talented. We had fat ones. We had, you know, and you, you, Almost turned into F. You went. Did he just say what I think he just said? <laughs> he, he had no. Uh, he no had th- no understanding. No, had like comes from that generation where that wasn't a bad thing. But it was John Foreman next to you because I went. Yep, and he goes. We had a gay one, we had a Jew, we had an Italian. Hey, diversity at its <laughs> yes. best. And that just and, and the saddest thing the three of us said was that's never going to get to air. Yeah. And it's such a shame because to watch that in real time meltdown on Twitter would have been the piece de resistance. Is that how you say that? The piece, piece de resistance. The pizza in the resistance. No, that's a, yeah. That, that, that's bringing Italian food into a war type of situation. But that's okay. We always should. <laughs> now, that was such a brilliant – because, and I will have that memory. It's one of my favourite memories of all time now with you, I me and John Foreman. I love being witness to something that others can't see. Yes. You know, there is something so exciting about that. Look, that day was very long as established by what we've been saying for the last five minutes. But separate to that, it was such an eclectic, and I'm, I'm using that really broadly. It in was. inverted, You know, the, the mix of people that were there yes. was like, I, I didn't know what era I was in. <laughs> I, I didn't know... I felt like I was in, in a casino, you yes. know, where you don't know whether it's day or night yes. or you've lost tra- tra- track of time, even though no you know clocks. it's taken forever. Yes. Um, but the great thing about events like that is you do find people that you just get a crush on and you yes. were one of them. Yes, and I just you're look, one of them. I look for playful, cheeky, smart people yeah, me that too. I can have a laugh and a me chat too. with and, and that's why we're here. But that was one of the finds and I'm not surprised Tina fell in love with you and, and brought you into the mix. Oh, thank you. That's so kind. But And I was just I've, – I've been such a big fan for such a long time and to meet you and have a, an instant connection, like have that chemistry was so special for me. I was like, I knew it. I knew in my guts that she was going to be a good good egg. And, you know, because sometimes you get let down, especially in this industry, and you're like, oh, I wish I hadn't met her. Yeah, I just wish don't I hadn't. know why people are like that, Me though. Neither. I don't understand how that can ever bode well. Firstly, they're robbing themselves of an opportunity to connect with someone. Secondly, it's embarrassing. 
you know, um, I remember years ago I was encouraged to go and speak to a young actor that had only just started in the industry and that I was supposed to, as an elder states person of a minority, go and introduce myself and it was a bit like, you know, uh, the Royal Command performance. And I, I went <laughs> over and I sort of didn't feel comfortable doing it because I was sort of being pushed or encouraged mm. with, you know, a vengeance to go and do it, welcome him into the fold. And I went over and I said, hi. And I can say who it is now because now he's a very good yeah, friend. Please. It was Alex Dimitriadis. Oh, good. And he good. did just, the guy had never really done much at that point. This is the very beginning of his career. And I went up and I said, Hi, Alex. Um, my name's Mary and I'm an actress and I wanted to say I'm super, you know, proud of the performance you put in. We just watched whatever it was. It was would have been. Uh, it wasn't head on. High. It would have been Heartbreak. Heartbreak High was his high, first the movie. movie. Yeah, the yeah. movie. And he was brilliant. He's such and a great actor. And I introduced actor. myself to him and he made me feel like I owed him money or something. Oh, and I was like, shit. wow, that didn't quite... <laughs> Go as I thought. <gasps> what a shame. But I often find that people that you don't connect with immediately, they can end up being really good friends yeah, too. can, can. And that's what's happened with us. Well, <laughs> No, me and Alex now. Oh, I, which you and I was I instant was like, and easy. What are you telling me? No, no, no. But, no but Alex yes. and I are close now. And that's so. the thing. You, you have to give sometimes, you have to give them a second go to – because some people don't and then that's their loss. But if you do give – someone a second chance and you should always give someone a second chance yeah. unless they've killed your mother then you know you will find that's maybe the real them not and a big fan of the third chance i reckon no, by the second one no. you should second know you should you work know. with the data at hand yeah. at that point if you got to give him a third chance yeah, then yeah. fool on you as george bush would say you got him fool you me once fool you know you, you can't fool a fool <laughs> Yeah, oh, what and he was full he was. of it, really, yeah, full a lot. of full. But no, totally. I think second chances are good. Second, yes, because there's nerves, there's some bravado. people are introverts. Some people That's are right. awkward and clumsy, and totally. they don't know how to respond. And we totally. know this from being women. Yeah, uh, and I'll just take it there for a minute. <laughs> you try to compliment a woman, and they'll argue with you. Thank you. You'll you say, just told me I have great eyebrows. Yes, and you know what you said? I do. Thank you. I do. Thank you. You, you agreed. Because I, I was used so to argue. excited by your and response. And you, your response, your reaction to it was so lovely. I loved it. Because you said, oh, I love that. And I was, I used to argue. It's argue. like when someone says, you, Yo, you look gorgeous. Oh, no, I don't. I look fat. I hate. No, I no, no. But I'm so tired. I didn't sleep. And, you know, I yeah, think my no. iron's down. You know, like everything. You're just like. So women want compliments. Yes. And then when they get them, they argue with yes. them. Yes. Well, so that's the patriarch has made us do that. And that's, you know, they pick pit us against each other. Once we figured that out, that's I can't when blame we... that for everything. I'm not going to blame it. It's like blaming the dog. Yeah, the I love – blame the dog. No. Blame like, – because I, you know what? 99.9% .9 of the time it is the dog, Mary. I know, but I worry it's in the DNA of us anyway. No, I don't. I do because I, I see how little girls do it and they genetic... haven't – they don't even know what patriarchy is. They do without even knowing – oh, don't get me started. Do you want to go there? Yeah, they only because they, I love men so much they, and, and they've been a big... No, yeah, no, but good men, right? Yeah, good men, of course. But, but the I don't patriarchy, like bad women either. You know, no, like, no, me neither. Maybe me neither. there's nothing worse, but that's that's another story. Am I am I going against us at this point? But um, I like... I mean, I've I've been advantaged by great men. Yes. Um, uh, men are uncomplicated. You want to use the word thick? Throw it in. <laughs> no, I don't say that. I'll say simple. I would say myopic. Simple. I would say simple in in not a like you know oh they're not they're not a hundred percent they're simple as in they've got something in mind and they're going towards that yes whatever it is I agree with that uh, where I disagree is how the patriarch has made it a very simple world for them and therefore they have thrived in that yes and the patriarchal world for women from birth has been like what we see our mothers do, we learn really quickly and we see the, the, the our fathers have it very easy in life. So you, from a very young age, I don't think it is in a DNA, I think it's really, really quickly ensconced on us, indoctrinated on us at a very young age that we don't even realise we're doing it. Like to, to be given the toys we're given, the options of the clothes we wear, the hair that we have to have instead of just, you know, because, I mean, I've done a whole episode on this. If you didn't know 
the gender, the genitals of a child, which you wouldn't if you don't see a child naked. Until the age of seven, you'd never know their gender. So if we didn't know their gender and we gave them every opportunity of toys, clothes, opportunity to play the way they want to, imagine the difference as far as the world would go for how they de- they develop for those first seven years. Do you agree with that at all? Y- yes, I would imagine that would have a, a great impact. But let me say this, maybe it's become, uh, we talked about this earlier, but yeah. maybe it's because I come from a Greek culture where I see how strong the women are. Yeah. I see how unapologetic they are. I see how, no offence, feminine the men can be while they, the, the guise is of a masculinity. No offence. They did invent. They did. You know. They did. The fire exit use. They did. Very early on. Um, I think that there is something about humanity that the Greeks understand at the core from yes. early on. They understood, and we talked about this as well, they understood that great conversation and debate is a good way to get to a truth. Yes. Not like, oh, okay, this is what I believe and I'm not budging on that. Socrates and Plato and all those guys just kept asking questions. questions. Yes. And we don't have that anymore. I we want to have agree all more. the answers, right? Could not agree more. But the same gender wise, I think, with the Greeks. Firstly, I my my parents never had toys, so forget that. My parents were never given the option of pink or blue, so forget that. Yep. You know, so that didn't play out in how they grew up and mm-hmm. they're the ones that I was raised by. Yeah. I was very much a tomboy like a lot of girls. You know, I loved hanging out with boys. I liked that it was more action orientated. I didn't want to sit inside and I had never had a doll, never had a doll bought for me because I didn't want one. Whatever I wanted, I asked for and I campaigned for and eventually got, but it was nothing to do with any of those typical things. Um, uh, so... I inherited something that I thought was pretty well fleshed out. I think what you, the way you were brought up is much better and much more the way I think we should bring up children. I think you were incredibly fortunate that you had that kind of an upbringing and that you came from generations that had a very similar upbringing because that kind of proved my, proves my point. The patriarchy that is evolved, has been evolved by colonial British white men. So that patriarchal system for the white man, it benefits the white man. And that's the kind of the point I was making that everyone else, so especially women, but including uh, minorities and men of other skin colours, they don't benefit from what that white British colonial patriarchy does. So that to me is exactly what I would love to see more of a Greek upbringing, like more where you're more accepting of letting your child just not have a lot and really use their creativeness and connect with each other rather than with something of plastic or, you know, some kind of status or... I remember... That through, you know, I had a father that was dying from before I was born. So I, I tended to archive every moment I had with him. Mm. I don't remember him once referring to my gender as a problem for anything. Right. He never said, as a girl or, you know, yeah. girl, never. I, I mean, you know. That's incredible because, you know, that goes was, on a lot in Anglo households, a lot. Yeah. Well, you know, Effie's got this joke about where women, Greek women sit and she says, you know, my mother wears the pants and washes and irons them too. <laughs> and that sort of says, you know, um, in, in my big fat Greek wedding, they talk about the woman being the neck that turns the head. Yes. It is very much a double act, a very successful double act. If anything, you'll see more more um, suppressed men than you would women yes, in the Greek right. culture. Yes, um, you know, that w- women don't feel the need to have to take away from the man, but they don't feel the need to apologise for their, you know, their capacities. Yeah, great. Of which there are many, you know. When I, my mother talks about her parents, she really only refers to her mother. Right, yeah, okay. She says, my father, he was, you know, he was a nice man. He was a simple man. But yeah. my mother, she was the entrepreneurial one. Yes. She's the one that was the midwife for, for the whole village. She's the one and she just talks her up. The other thing I think with the Greek culture, and we'll move on because apparently there are other cultures in the world, but, <laughs> um, you know, the, the thing that I love the most is how 
open to variety and character they are. Yeah. And how there's not a lot of judgment about it. Yeah. Um, my father-in-law just turned 90. Biggest spunk in any room when I uh, – we're at a wedding, we're at a funeral, we're at a Christmas. I always think, okay, who's the best-looking guy here? Oh, my God, it's Mr. Jim again. You know, like he's 90. He's got a full head of hair. He's got rosy cheeks. He's tall. He's got – he's a movie star. And we decided to do a dinner at a Greek restaurant, a tiny Greek restaurant, but they had a live band, just, you know, three, four-piece band. And he got there and he was a little annoyed that it all just looked too small and, you know, it wasn't like the big place we often go to and he was just a little inconvenienced by that and possibly by the fact that my mother-in-law made him very late and he doesn't like to get anywhere Yeah, I, I second He that, likes I second to get that. there 15 minutes before time. Same. That makes him happy. Not on this day. So we get there. The band, he realises about halfway through, you know, the first hour that the band are his own, you know, he can make requests and they're going to play whatever he wants. So they're his band in this small venue (laughs) with a a dance floor right next to where he's sitting. This is getting better and better for him now. So now the Greeks, the Greeks, because we're very liberal, very open-minded, very much staying in the present, very much will cry loudest, will dance loudest, will cheer loudest, we're on the tables, yes. we're breaking plates. Yes. We live, we go commando online. Yes, right? we live large. So normally in Greek dancing we dance around in a circle and we hold hands or you do the uh, the sassy dance, you do the Shakiras, <laughs> you know, you, you get – you break up in, in in a group, you know, I mean, just two of you maybe, often two women, often a man and a woman, and the woman does the shakira, shakira, and she wobbles and she does this and then the man claps, you know, kneeling down claps and then they swap it and then the other one gets up. And it is, it is a very sexual thing, but it's never seen like that by the Greeks. You're not like, oh, what's with the whorish dance? You don't <laughs> sit there and there you go, that's one of the most popular Greek dances. Yes. So this blonde woman... Who's not young and she's not old. Maybe she's like 50. Yeah. Right? She's looking good, right? She's got the bodycon dress on. She's got the bleach blonde hair on. She's got some fake tan on. And she's there and she's happy to be looked at, right? And she is dancing all night with a 90-year-old who she doesn't even know. But this is the way we roll. And one of the things you do was when when it's your turn to star in the this little duet, the one that's supporting gets down on the knees and claps while cheering the other one on oh, to yeah, do Yeah, I can see it. I right? know exactly what you're so talking about. So my father-in-law at 90, it takes him two goes, <laughs> but one of the things you're supposed to do is lift your head over the head of the kneeling, uh, your, 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 leg. your leg, over the head of the kneeling, clapping person. So he's tried once, he hasn't decapitated her, but he didn't quite get it over. And then he's like, damn it, I'm going to get it over. This is, I'm peaking here. I'm 90 and I'm yeah. dancing with this hot 50-year-old. And then, bang, the leg goes over and the whole place stands <gasps> up and she's cheering him on and he's loving it and they're doing shots and <gasps> Opa. that's how we roll. Oh, I love it. Because you cannot assume that there'll be a 91 and you cannot assume anything other than right in this moment we can just celebrate that we're alive and we're having this opportunity to be on our feet and enjoying. She, she didn't even probably know it was his 90th. No, you know, it doesn't matter. She was just matter. at another table. But they do that and they don't endow uh, human behaviour with just convenient, lazy, you know, perceptions of, oh, there's the whorish dance and here's the blonde with the, you know, because she wasn't that at all. No. She was just loving life. If that was a man, we wouldn't have thought that. But you know what? In, in Greek culture, we don't think that either. I've got to hang out in great culture a little bit more. Can we talk about your stand-up show? Yes. The new one. The new one. Tell me a bit about that. Um, I like to every year or every 18 months write a new Effie show. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I bring a bit of theatre to it, not only because of the character and the look and all of that, but I like to dress it up a bit. It's not stand-up. I've not really done stand-up, but it's my version of theatrical stand-up. Yeah. So what I realised years ago, and I wish I'd realised earlier, there is nothing like stand-up to have the most intravenous relationship with an audience. True. Literally stand up with a microphone, have a conversation. Yeah. Except my conversation is two-way. So it's an hour show, 
but the first half hour is me exploring whatever the theme of that show is and I pick a theme every show. Okay. Yeah. And then the second half hour, there is no break, I segue into half an hour of impro with the audience every okay. single night. Brilliant. And I've been doing this with every show for the last 30 plus years. I love getting to know my audience. I love what they bring to me every night. That's so amazing. And it's there's really, so many artists that don't that don't have that, as you say, that intravenous relationship. That they they love their audience, but it's they're over there and they're they're the act. So to have that and that you've been doing it for thirty years because that's what you truly love and enjoy. I want to share the stage with others. I just happen to work on my own a lot. Yeah. So that's my way of sharing the stage. And I don't bring them up. I let them sit wherever they are. Yeah, yeah. I don't pick on them. Yeah, good. I don't pick on them. I had a friend of mine who used to write for Dame Medna and then he he sort of, you know, he and I were talking about doing stuff together and he would write jokes for me and I'm like, but Effie's never mean. No, yeah. You know, and whereas Edna was. Yeah. And that was the charm of Edna. Yep, exactly. Right? Because it was a man as a woman, you know, like. Yeah. Whereas Effie's not mean but she's truthful. And so, um, yeah, the conversation gets started with the audience and they they put their hand up and offer up whatever it is that we're talking about and then we take it from there. And it just is the most exciting part of anything that I do is just reacting to what I get given and building with whatever they give me. And it's it's so fantastic. So people come back and see the show again and again because they know half of it's different every night. That's brilliant. Mm. So you know the one thing... I'm not a massive stand-up fan, even though I have so many stand-up friends, but I have a, a real – it's just to me it's a monologue that I'm not a part of and all I can offer is a laugh because if we say anything, then we're heckling. Yeah. Um, and I get that, completely get the premise of a stand-up, but it's so weird when there's 200 of us and there's just one of you and a one spotlight, one microphone – uh, one stool, one cup of drink. You know, it's it's a very – and I know why people love it, but it's probably the same reason I don't really like it. It's not immersive enough for yeah. me. And it, seeing the show twice is so weird for me. Like seeing someone – I have friends that I've seen their shows and then I'll see them go on ABC shows or whatever and they'll do a bit – this is what makes them so brilliant at what they do. They're saying these stories like they've never said yeah. them before and that is the the real genius of it and what makes – you know, people think they can do stand-up until they try to tell a story twice and they always give themselves away, you know, because it sounds rehearsed. The brilliance of a stand-up is saying something that you really do – sound like you've just thinking of it on the spot um so seeing that i i absolutely love and adore that ability to do that um but seeing it kind of freaks me out as well because i'm like oh i know exactly what you're gonna say yeah right unless you're sitting next to someone and you go wait 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 for this bit wait for this bit but that's like watching a rerun yeah you know for me and you know what is going to be said um but look i, I love that you're doing something different every it, show. I, I realised very early on in Wogs Out of Work because our, our audiences had never been to the theatre. They weren't theatre-going audiences with Wogs Out of Work. They were television Tele- and movie yeah. audiences. So they were accustomed to talking to a screen. Yes. So when Wogs Out of Work happened... The original prior, goggle boxes. Exactly. Prior to uh, Acropolis, so they we weren't famous but the show was, they would talk to us even though you're doing a monologue. And it was not a stand-up. Well, it was a character monologue with the narrative and props and things. And they would talk to us. And I was like, they want to talk to us. Yes. And I want to talk to them. Why not? Why so not then let I it started happen? doing shows where I was able to talk to them and we were able to have a conversation, you know. And it's it's fun. It's exciting. And and I think, why are they even saying this? They probably wouldn't say this to one person, but they're saying it to five hundred. Yeah, yeah. But I think Effie is very disarming in the sense that she'll throw herself under the bus. She'll admit to her stuff. Yeah. And and I think, well, it, it, they love her so much and they think, well, if she can do that, I can do it that too. It disarms, doesn't yeah. it, that kind of vulnerability and truth in in, in humour. it's There's nothing better. Um, I remember seeing old videos of performances from Wogs Out of Work on VHS and the audience really is involved and it's so good. Like right up to Wogs, Wogs in whatever the names of things 
there's still going these tours yeah. where the comedians go on tour together. The last one I saw was 2020. Yeah. And um, because I was in the jungle with Tahir Belchik. Right. And he tours with the Wogs Out of Work cr- crew. And they were all just so, I mean, there's new ones, but, yeah. you know, George. George Capanaris, Joe Avati, still, still, Nick Giannopoulos, Sushi Mango, still, I just did a big performance with at the Opera House a couple of weeks ago. They're brilliant. Um, you know, like it's good. It's good for us to work with each other. We already love each other. So it's good because all of us work solo. Yes. So it's only when, a, 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 you know, and because I don't come from a stand-up background, for when, when they say to me, oh, could you get up and do seven minutes, I'm like, well, where's the beginning, middle and end? Where's the storytelling? <laughs> seven minutes. Oh, okay. Well, I better find seven minutes that I can do. Um, and it's good. You get to, to stretch your own capacities, but also you get to see all the other young talent that's coming up that's doing great stuff. That's Well, and not only the young talent, but watching the, that particular um, troupe with the audience. Like, so we've got new ones coming into the team, but the new audiences of generations, new generations still being just like they were in the 80s. Yeah. Um, when I went to see to hear and, and watch George and um, Ava, what's it? Joe. Joe. Yeah. Um, like this, they still got it. Like yeah. it's like they're just, and the audience so receptive, so beautiful because yeah. you can go to a lot of comedy shows and the audience laughs but they're not like that. Yeah. And they sell out. There yeah. is an audience for this to get. I just did um, – Paulie Fennick's new show, The Daradon Council, and I played the ex, the mayor's ex-wife. Guess who played the mayor? George Ca- Capanaris. Oh yeah. Lovely man. Yeah, great. Such a lovely man to work great. with. Great. So generous yeah. to work with. So it was just wonderful because I thought, oh, if I can get some acting work and get that audience, oh, I'm set for life. But, yeah. you know, I'm not woggy enough. Yeah, I don't know whether they're only looking for that I think anymore. El Dor really just... did really well on Houses with that. Yeah, with that audience. I just think that you've just, you know, they relate to, um, I suppose, someone that has similar traits, not necessarily yeah. similar DNA. And I don't think it's about that. I think what they're looking for is something live and vibrant, and you're yes. those things, and smart and cheeky and open and playful and and all those great things that make. Make it feel live, like what you were saying, Evie. It doesn't feel like I've pre-prepared this yeah. speech earlier, you know. And no one wants to see something that's on an assembly line. No, that's come out right. The same, exactly the same every day with no vary, well, no variation or anything. So, yeah, look, I love it. I love it, and I, you know, I do the best rooms in the country, and I do the worst ones, yeah, and everything yeah. in between. And and I like the challenge of of all of that. Yeah, and and the fact that you have challenges still is great, isn't it? Because you're doing something new, like changing it up. So you yeah, keep like yourself the other day, fresh. I, it, was, it was the last show of my the sh- the show I did before this new one, and um, I get to the venue, and it's just such a schmozzle. The cues have to be done via a computer. The laptop's on stage, but the guy that's operating it is at the back of the the room. So, therefore, how are the cues going to happen? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the house lights are in the wings of the stage. Yeah. Oh. There's only one guy in three different positions and I'm there going, okay, this is going to be a disaster. Somehow we diverted it. We pulled this poor guy, Darren, in, who's uh, picking up glasses in the uh, in the venue. Um, he's not technical. Uh, the guy <gasps> aged in front of my eyes when he was asked <laughs> to do what he had to do. And... Um, you know, as soon as I saw that the elements of the show that I bring, which is video and music and all those theatrical elements that that dress the show up, that that are Effie style, that set up the premise. As soon as I saw that 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 all was working, and at least no matter what else happened, there would be the setup to the whole show would still be happening. I come on, and you know what? If I'm in darkness, or you know, then I can live with that. At least I've I've got a show. Yeah. It was the best show I did of the run. It was better than any of the posh venues I did. It was because I was so stressed prior to, as soon as I saw, hold on, it's actually on screen, it's happening, then I was so relaxed. Yeah, And I had such a great audience that was so Anglo and so rural. When I went home and I said to my husband, it was going to be the worst show I've ever done and it was the best show I did of the run. 
That's what happens and you don't know that until you're there. Yeah. And so that's the magic. Next year you've got more of these shows. And yeah, I'm how- starting um, uh, my show. My new show is called Up Yourselfness <laughs> and it is about, I suppose, the greatest immunity that you can have from all the things that are happening in the world and have happened particularly in the last few years yeah. is that if you are secure in who you are, then you should be open to accepting other people for who they are. That's big. It, but it's the truth. Yeah, it is. Um, if you need everyone to agree with you, then maybe you're not so secure about what you're saying. You know, yeah, and, and there's good. no room for evolving True. if you stop listening. True. And and I think you know, as Effie says, there's a political correctness is having a bitch fight with freedom of speech currently. Yeah, and um, and you can be two things at once. Yeah, in fact, not mutually exclusive, are they? They don't need to be. Yeah, well, that's actually something that I need to take heed of um, often. I think it's a good reminder because it is really easy to speak in a vacuum. Yeah, and have people that listen to you and follow you on social media that agree with everything you say. Mm. So you, that is a really nice timely reminder. Thank you for that. I've been working, um, I don't know whether you've had the privilege of seeing the new show that's been on Binge called Strife. I, ha- I haven't started it yet, oh but it's God, on the it's list. so brilliant. It's Asha Ketty and, yeah, she's and, so and it's based on Mia Friedman's, you know, work strife balance memoir loosely. There are, you know, creative choices amongst, um, you know, the, the telling of that story. But essentially it was a, a woman that did really well in publishing that decided to, to create the largest female platform with uh, Mamma Mia. Uh, this is called Eve Life because Evelyn is the Asher car- yeah. character. So the first woman, Eve. Eve right, Life. of course. And it's it's the most fantastic show. It's um, brilliantly directed, stunningly written by this showrunner and a couple of other writers that came on and, and wrote episodes. Uh, Sarah Scheller, she did The Let Down on the ABC. Oh, yeah, the great She's just show. genius. <laughs> and it's produced by my bestie and her company, um, Bruna Papandrea, made up stories um, with her husband Steve Hutensky and Jodie Madison and the brilliant people at Fox Soul that back this very early on and said just take it where you need it to go. And it is just such a great, great, punchy, relevant show. It's such a it's sort of like a devil wears Prada, yeah. but without that sort of rarefied yeah. space. It's a, 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 a trying to get something almost impossible out there into the world, working with lots of women, um, you know, um, and it's it was it, the first series tackles it at around the 2012 era okay. and then it'll catch up. There's a second series oh, that will happen. And I've just come on as a writer on the second series. Oh, great. And, um, and I walked into the writer's room. We spent a month caged up like creative little animals, um, fleshing out storylines and character arcs and all of that for a month. It was awesome. And I came in and um, I was talking about reading something that I didn't agree with. And, well, I didn't agree. I thought I didn't agree, right? And uh, we were talking about because everyone's talking about what they're reading or I saw this article and, you know, we're looking for bits to to bounce off within the, the show and just just to chat, just to get to know each other more and more. And so in the writer's room there's the showrunner, Sarah, and then there's um, a, a great guy, Eric, who was notating everything almost like a court stenographer that captures everything. There's Which multiple. Rachel's doing right now. Yeah, there's multiple um, whiteboards yep. which we plot and then there's four or five writers that sit there and offer up, what if? What if Evie's character was to go through this and at what point do we do that? And and then so the first week is just brainstorming all the possibilities and then the next three weeks are plotting the eight episodes. So you spend two days on each episode to plot what's happening, what the main story is and what the, um, you know, the, ne- the, the story underneath that is and what all the characters are doing, right? So it requires, it's, it's like doing, you know, like a cryptic crossword puzzle yeah. essentially. And um, I, when I came in, I said that I'd been reading um, something that, you know, I thought was interesting because it's not how I look at the world. Yeah. But people were like, what, what do you mean? It's sort of unusual for, for, for people, people to want to ingest anything that might stretch them in a different way, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. that's really scary that we're closing off to all of that sort it of stuff. It is actually, isn't it? Like the, I think knowledge is power. So read everything and listen to everything. I'm so guilty of that. Like, I think that political correctness can make us boycott things that 
well, you know, sometimes for good reason, but sometimes for bad. You know, it's, it's almost like chopping your nose off to spite your face. But I did know you were part of the second season, but not the first. No, so just the no, second. No, not the first. Because Bruna Papandrea, she's very female led projects. Is yep. that correct? Yep. Like, was she. Um, wonderful show, Nicole Kidman. Yeah, they they did Big Little Lies. Big Little Lies. And she's done a million great things. And then she was in partnership with Reese Witherspoon and yes. then has since partnered up with her husband. Yes. And then an Australian partner, Jody Madison. And so the three of them run Made Up Stories is made the name of their stories. company. And they do stuff all over the world, but they've really focused a lot of energy on Australian product. Wow, that's wonderful. And so that's super exciting. And, you know, she's the, the youngest of our group of friends. And she's, you know, smart as a whip and just so um, has read everything, has read things even before publishers have got their hands on it, you know, like all sorts of stuff, like devours material and has, has used to work for Anthony Minghella and Sidney Pollock. Oh, and wow. They, she loves adaptation. She loves getting books um, adapted into either yeah. films or television shows and she's done that brilliantly. And, and so she knew Mia. She'd gone um, and lived with her, I think, at one point, but certainly they were besties very early on in their early 20s. And then when Mia wrote this book, Bruna said, oh, yeah, this could be a really good television show. And she's worked with Asher a lot on a number of different projects. And so Asher came in um, to star in it and produced it as well. Oh, and brilliant. And so she's one of the producers of it and she's so brilliant. Oh, I can't wait to watch it. I it's, mean, so it's on my list. Yeah. So for your show, yep. where do people buy tickets, find you? Maryandeffie.com forward slash tour for all um, ticket sales. And I've also been touring my Mary stage show Yes, called This Is Personal, yes. which I did um, 2022 at the Opera House and then I toured 2023 and that I'll continue to tour. You're still going to tour 2024. Correct. And so, yeah, I mean, I was doing Dancing with the Stars and I did, I was touring still both shows. Oh, an Effie show and that show sort of every now and again. Showing off. Um, but, you know, you, you've got to be out there, right? Absolutely. You want to get out of your head into yeah, your you world. Do. Yeah, you're right. And, and go out there. It does and help. Put all that stuff that you're feeling and that you think that, you know, is a great offering to the world out there. And, you know, I'll, I'll just do it one show at a time. Yeah, good. Well, those um, that link will be in our show notes for every, everyone listening. Mary Custis, what's your middle name? I don't have one. Why? I don't know. We're not so big on that. Is the that, Greeks. yeah, the Greeks? No, Maybe the Greek modern thing. Greeks are, but it yeah. wasn't traditional. Like unless you were sucking up to your mother-in-law or something, you had to shove it in as a second name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but if you were, you know, um, committed to whatever the name was, I was unfortunately named after, because my mother's name is Theophany, which I suppose, well, this is, you know how you mentioned Faye? yeah. When my mother first came to Australia, she came out on her own. She was 17, lied on her passport, said she was 18. She just needed – she was ambitious and she didn't want to spend the rest of her life in that village that she did not like. Right. So she came out on her own. When she got to Australia, she was told her name in English should be Faye. She didn't like it because Faye in Greek means eat. Oh, imagine being told that when by someone saying someone your name saying, now has to be eat. You know, your name is eat. Anyway, she didn't like it. Many, many years later, my mum is um, the type of person that listens to talk back, listens to, she wants to hear things all the time, television shows and whatever. So my mum used to watch a lot of those American soap operas during the day, so she has an American accent on a handful of words. I love it. What? Gasp. <laughs> Carador. Things like that. Anyway, one day she was ironing and that show Perfect Match was on. And she loved it. Such a she great loved show. anything cringy. Yes. She liked her, like, what are you, stupid? He's beautiful. Or why would you pick her? She's the one that's shallow, whatever it was. She she's very interactive, a bit like our stage show audiences, yeah. right? So she she hated Faye, she hated Faye. And I'm in my bedroom and she's ironing away, and then I hear her. That's it. That's it. That's my name. Not bloody Faye. And I go into the lounge room and she says, my name is Tiffany, Theophany, Tiffany, like Tiffany Lamb. And then she wanted us to call her Tiffany. I said, you're, you're not a Tiffany. No. 
You're I nothing love like a Tiffany. She wants to be a Tiffany. She wants to be a Tiffany. Yeah, Tiffany is a definite look, isn't it, of a of a of a woman. It's a great character name for someone. Yeah, well, and that maybe that woman that was at the restaurant with your fa- with your grandfather, she could have been. She called could Tiffany. have been a Tiffany. Yeah, but your mum, not so much. My, my mum occasionally someone will go, "Hi, Tiffany," and I'm like, "Really." Oh, I love she that. Said, May I have to? Sometimes I don't like fi. And then her real name in Greek is Fanny. Theo Fanny, but they call them Fanny, the, the second half. And then people, when she tries to introduce herself as Fanny, they'll say Fanny. And she'll say, No, no, Mea, she's Fanny. I am Fanny. <laughs> but actually, she's funnier than me. Yeah, she sounds it. Totally. And that's saying something because you're f- Hilarious. No, no, my mum is super funny. I was telling Romy, Romy and, and my mum have got a great thing going on. Just to let you know, Romy is in the room with us now. This is my bestie's son and, bestie's and the father, Steve, who's, who's also a bestie. Um, he's he's with me. We're, you know, enjoying Spending each other's the day company. Together. I love this. And my mother today said, because I was at my brother's cafe, my brother owns a great cafe in Richmond in yes. Melbourne called Rowena Corner Store. That's it. That's right? it. On Rowena Street. That's right. So we're there, we're eating. And I was a former waitress because you can't be an actress if you haven't been a waitress. Exactly. That's the way we roll. Exactly. So I can't stand plates that are used and in front of me and plus I'm hyperactive. So I clear the table and my mother turns to me and she goes, Mia, want to get a job? I know the honour. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's in the bag, in the bag. Even if she does stuff like everything, she's got a joke for everything. Oh, I love her. Everything. She said to Romy, she's 84, uh, when I get old, because I'm not old now, I'm not old. You know, so yeah. she's 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 when saying she's old. going to get yeah, old at eighty four, and, and she's she, right. Yeah, she said she won't die until my daughter's at least eighteen because she doesn't want to be forgotten. So we've got another eight. Yeah. Oh, but you've got a lot more than that, yeah. I reckon. Her mother lived to be ninety three. Yeah, well, that's the thing. The the, the Mediterranean diet—they're oily. They live forever. You, and that I love the walking. And the, I, when I lived in Sydney, I lived in little. Um, Portugal, so Stanmore Mm -hmm. around there, and every night watching all my neighbours walk with their hands behind their backs. I just love that. You know, the Greeks, the Italians, they all do it as well. My mother likes walking. When I first did Wogs Out of Work, we were living in King's Cross because we're at the Enmore Theatre forever. Yes. And so my mum would come up and stay with me. Now, King's Cross is, you know, particularly in the 80s, was pretty rough, right? Pretty rough. A lot of drugs, a lot of prostitution, you know, very urban. Let's just put it that way. So my mother, like most Greek mothers, loves to walk and loves to put everything that's valuable into a handbag. So I would say to her, now, you've got to be careful. I don't know why you do this. You've got your passport, you've got your jewellery, you've got everything in your handbag. You need to not put valuable things. But Mia, what if I need it? All right? And I go, okay, but what if you get mugged? Mia, come on, come on. So, okay, so we'd walk. We'd be walking through, you know, King's Cross. And I just slow down and let her walk a little in front of me and then I punch her handbag out of her her hand. From behind. And Oof. grab it and go, I've got it now. What are you but gonna- me, I wasn't ready. That was her response. So I think I made my point. She did not quite make hers. But, um, yeah, they're, they're funny people. Oh, absolutely. Oh, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for coming in, giving me your time, giving me your humour, your insight, your love. I absolutely adore you. Yeah, me too. You're one of a kind. Thank you. Uh, If you like this episode, and I know you did, please rate, review, subscribe. Do all the things that you you know I want you to do. I'm happy to be in your ear holes. You've had Mary in your ear holes today. And what a beautiful voice to have in those holes of yours. I will be with you in on Tuesday on my solo app. Um, love you all, good boy. See you later. (laughs) 